Before we begin, I'd like to state that the views represented in this podcast are those of the individuals in this conversation and not the official position of Boston Avenue United Methodist Church. The case of Julius Jones in Oklahoma has brought conversations around the death penalty front and center nationally. Today, to talk with us about this contentious issue and how we approach it as people of faith is Reverend David Wiggs, Senior Pastor at Boston Avenue United Methodist Church. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me, Caitlin and Philip. David Wiggs here. I use he, him, his. So to start with, um, as Christians, we go back to scripture for a lot of things. So what does the Bible tell us or give us to think about when it comes to the death penalty? Well, our scriptures... Uh, are a vast array of a variety of writings in different formats, not really a monolithic book as sometimes it's portrayed as, and often it has more than one perspective, uh, and that would be true around death and murder and killing uh, and what's appropriate. In some places that's prohibited. In other places you can find God um, giving instruction to God's people to completely massacre of a whole village because they were not faithful or something like that. So um, what the United Methodists do, our perspective is uh, where we use scripture as a starting place, just as your question did, but then we also use tradition or what the best minds of Christian life have thought and written over the centuries. Uh, We use our own experience or conscience or prompting of God Uh, as it plays into whatever this issue might be in this discussion today around the death penalty or capital punishment. But then we also, uh, based on our founders, John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement, was an Oxford professor teaching philosophy. So he really believed in the use of reason and logic and thinking through issues. So I would say uh, because the witness of scripture is a little bit varied in terms of violence uh, and death, that uh, we would use tradition, experience, and reason as well to think through uh, what a Christian response should be or could be to the idea that the state has the right to put people to death. The Methodist Church has a book of discipline, which mentions the death penalty. Can you explain what the book of discipline is and what it says about the death penalty? Sure. The Book of Discipline for the United Methodist Church is like our guidebook. It has uh, history and doctrine in it, but it also has a whole list of guidelines for how you organize a local church or how you get a new pastor or how the finances are to be done in a way that's uh, accountable, those kind of things. Uh, Within that, we also have a section called the Social Principles, where A group of United Methodists have gotten together and written uh, statements to address a whole variety of social issues, Um, the death penalty or capital punishment being one of those uh, that is addressed in there. So we do have a a couple of paragraphs in that list of statements about life as Christians and how we approach it. So at many points in my faith journey, I really struggled with um, what seemed like the hypocrisy of very publicly pro-life Christians, um, particularly politicians, um, within my own faith denomination, but also outside of that, um, who really had a lot of effort when it came to the issue of abortion, had a lot to say about that. Um, and who didn't really seem to show up or talk much about the death penalty. Um, So I think about the Catholic church in which I was raised, where we had a prayer for the unborn babies. We did not have a prayer for the death row inmates. Um, And so that really bothered me. um, And it continued to bother me after I left church. Uh, And I know that for many of my kind of none or done friends, uh, this is a, a huge struggle. Um, and kind of one of those places where people point and go, yeah, Christians, they're, they're, they're inconsistent. They're not, they're not pro-life. Um, so can you respond to that concern or that issue? Right. I think there's two or three uh, arenas to uh, think about when we're talking about that kind of thing. 
One is I would say, yes, that is an inconsistent ethic if a person is stridently in favor of being anti-abortion uh, or pro-life um, around the idea of an unborn child uh, while not addressing you know, violence in the foster care system or the violence of state-sanctioned death. Um, so certainly that's an inconsistency. Of course, we also have uh, a problem within the church that I believe gets exacerbated because of partisan politics where people running for office do polling and look for wedge issues or issues that get a lot of traction, have a lot of emotion, and enough so that it will move the needle in terms of which direction somebody might go to vote. So I believe the fact that we have a two-party system, which I endorse, but on the downside of the two-party system is how politicians use it on these wedge issues. Uh, and so they begin to exaggerate or emphasize a particular issue as if it's the only important issue. And certainly theologians or churches do that as well. Uh, you know, I had a friend uh, who's a Christian from a different denomination. Um, this back in 2016, we're discussing um, the presidential election and the election of President Trump. Uh, and she simply said abortion was the only issue that mattered to her. And it didn't matter what other unethical things he did. Once he said publicly that he was going to oppose uh, Roe v. Wade and abortions and that kind of thing, that settled everything in terms of who she would vote for. To me, that is such a truncated view of ethics or morality or how you might make a decision about who's the most fit candidate to lead the country. That happens both in religion and politics. So certainly you can level that argument against Christians that they get hyper-focused sometimes on a single issue. Um, they're not the only, I would just say Christians, we're not the only ones that do that. Uh, and I think in fact, it gets exacerbated by uh, the kind of partisan political environment we live in these days. Um, then the other thing is we, I think, you know, it's the way that it's um, couched sometimes is a child is an, an unborn child, or I would say often a fetus or an embryo is seen as fully human before it's actually, in my view, fully human. And so any kind of uh, abortion at any point is just absolutely wrong. I don't think biblically you can justify that. Um, theologically, I don't think you can make a very strong argument for that. Certainly, uh, we have a right to life, but we don't really have absolute rights uh, within our life and our laws. We're all the time negotiating between my freedom and over against somebody else's freedom or my rights over against somebody else's rights. That's an ongoing dilemma in human life. Um, and so when you make... Uh, when you set it up as an innocent child um, is a way to frame it that carries you in one direction over against a guilty murderer. Uh, you draw a dichotomy, uh, which makes it easier for a person to justify one position over the other. What we know now from the last 20 to 30 years of research and the introduction of DNA and other things is that often we have executed or put to death people who were entirely innocent, who had no crime, and yet they were tried, convicted, put in prison, and then killed. And so uh, that's problematic, I think, for people who are trying to look at ethical or moral decisions uh, from a faith perspective. If we know we have a system that makes such egregious mistakes, then I think we really have to step back and reconsider um, what the, does that mean in terms of the powers we give to the state? The United Methodist Church uh, has opposed the death penalty uh, for a long time, not only because now we know we have innocent people who've been put to death, but as Christians, we believe that God can redeem any person, uh, that every person can change, that repentance and redemption are possible, uh, even if somebody has done something egregious, and so to put someone to death um, ends 
the option for that person to be a changed person in this lifetime. Um, and so if we begin theologically with the position that all people um, are children of God and created by God, and that God can manifest a change in a person's life, uh, even if they're a murderer, even if they were a child abuser, uh, that change can happen, uh, then the death penalty seems contrary to our that foundational theological belief. So that's that's the position the United Methodist Church has taken, uh, is that God is in the world working for redemption, and for us to short-circuit that is contrary to God's ultimate aims. So we oppose the death penalty for that reason. Many death penalty cases involve a victim or victim's family who are hurt and grieving and suffering tremendous loss. And I think one perspective on the death penalty is, who are we to deny them justice? How do we as Christians respond to victims and also to concerns around justice? Excellent question. So, you know, most of our justice system in the U.S. as well as around the world really is based on punishment and retribution under the title of justice, as if killing somebody else is balances the scales of somebody being murdered to begin with. Um, I think that's um, not the highest form of reasoning we might use in terms of what would really restore relationships or make for justice. The United Methodist Church believes in what we call restorative justice over against retribution or revenge or criminal justice that's focused on punishment like the death penalty is. You know, families calling for justice uh, often in death penalty cases, you know, are calling for a person to be put to death. Um, and, and, and the troubling part of that, which I mentioned earlier, is that we know that we often make mistakes. So nobody wants to rob a family who's lost a loved one to murder in terms of their own healing or their ability to recover from such a tragedy. So the United Methodist Church would say, we are concerned about all parties involved. And if we had a system of restorative justice, it would look at not only the victim or the victim's family, but also the perpetrator and the perpetrator's family. And what role does the government have to try to make society whole or wholesome or just? Um, and so we've, I think we have a lot of work to do. I think putting someone to death is a, uh, a rather limited way to truly say that we have fulfilled justice in any uh, kind of broader definition. So you mentioned restorative justice, and I think, um, you know, there are many people who would acknowledge that the current criminal justice system that we have is not not functioning the way that we would like it to, um, that parts of it are very deeply broken. So thinking about you know, our faith lens, um, but can you tell us more about restorative justice or just kind of these more productive ways that we might approach um, criminal justice? Right, so what uh, we try to do within the United Methodist uh, way of dealing with this is create ministries we call criminal justice and mercy ministries. Uh, ideally, um, they seek to hold um, an offender or a perpetrator accountable. Certainly, we want law and order. We want accountability. We want safety. We are against crime. Uh, we don't want anyone involved in that on any, either of any of all those sides. Um, and so we do care about the victim uh, and the victim's family and those who are uh, on the downside who are the victims of crime. Um, but simply to what I would say is be reactionary in terms of trying to destroy somebody else's life uh, is not a full ethic for Christians as working to hold the perpetrator accountable uh, repair the damage, figure out if amends can be made. How do we right the wrong? How do we bring healing to individuals and families? And in some cases, the 
the community. I mean, that's one of the issues for Tulsans. I'm sitting here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're 100 years out from the 1921 um, race massacre uh, of whites perpetrating crime against blacks. Um, how, what does justice mean? How do we get there when a whole community was basically burned to the ground, their homes looted, people killed, others run out of town, lost their property, their wealth, and their family and community relationships. What is justice in that kind of situation? And how do we get there? Trying to kill everybody that had anything to do with that doesn't seem to be a great solution. And yet in a microcosm, that's exactly what we do uh, around murder cases or other capital crimes. Um, so, uh, it's just uh, the restorative aspect is a fuller way to look at what justice might mean and what the role of the government or the state could be. You know, um, in the discussions around uh, Black Lives Matter, the whole idea that just having a military style or a, um, a style of policing based on weapons and force is perhaps too narrow a way for us to think about what it means to have law and order, that perhaps we need uh, mental health professionals and other kinds of services available uh, in the midst of crime or before crime happens or in response to crime. And certainly restorative justice would have that bigger picture in mind when trying to figure out how, how do we improve our criminal justice system and our system of laws and responses uh, so that we truly do bring healing and wholeness to people and not just perpetuate the, the killing as the, is the case with capital punishment. So specifically the Julius Jones case, which kind of sparked um, this conversation for a lot of people, um, we learned just a few hours ago that Governor Stitt decided to commute that sentence but ahead of that news and ahead of that information, I know that many of my friends, including some who are members here at the church, um, were just really struggling with the knowledge of this broken system. Um, we're grieving this situation. Um, some of them are parents of young children. And so just this, this heavy knowledge of this world that you are, you know, trying to raise your child in, um, and so just a lot of feelings. Um, and I think for some Christians, kind of that question I asked earlier, um, seeing the real extreme polarization, it's also caused them to question their own faith, um, you know, the faith of other Christians kind of been pushing them to feel, um, just to feel, feel struggle in all of this. So lots of feelings um, for those maybe in your flock or not, um, who are really looking um, and seeing this as a very broken situation, um, what, what words of hope or what call to action or what are some of the ways that we can, can process this um, that are going to be healthy for our faith lives? Well, I think as individuals, we, we, are, we do have some responsibility of playing a role in our life together as a community or as a nation or as a state. But I think we also have to be very careful that we not um, become so overwhelmed by problems in our system that we do lose all hope or we do become so disillusioned with the problematic parts of our life together that we're overwhelmed. Certainly, we have a criminal justice system that, according to statistics, incarcerates more women than any place in the world, incarcerates more people than any place in the world that disproportionately incarcerates people of color in this country. Um, so clearly there are problems with the system. Um, and I think so for individuals, we have to figure out, are there steps I can take? Is there a place I can begin uh, to try to affect that system, uh, which would improve it? So what United Methodists have decided to do is that we do need to have people, pastors and others designated to work with people in the criminal justice system, whether that be somebody 
incarcerated or somebody related to somebody incarcerated or someone who's been incarcerated coming out of the system, or it might be a victim of crime um, or a victim of, you know, crime through their family members. Uh, they're, they're, obviously, there is great tragedy and great harm done when someone is murdered or raped or abused, and we want to be a culture who says that's unacceptable and we're going to do all we can do to stop that from happening again. Um, but I think for each individual, um, it's kind of an individual decision about where do they plug into this overall process. Um, but I think we always have to keep an eye toward, um, we know the intent is to offer the opportunity for justice. Um, when we slip into retribution and punishment, I think we don't do as well as if we're moving toward, toward the restorative justice I talked about earlier. Um, but, you know, we have to recognize just like some other, you know, something like as big as climate change, that we have a role to play uh, and we can figure out what we do, uh, but sort of the old adage about, you know, think globally, but act locally. I think is important in terms of any social issue we're trying to get a handle on. Uh, is there something I can do in my neighborhood or in my city or my community uh, that addresses this, that makes an improvement upon it? You know, bigger solutions are, you know, becoming a lawyer or becoming a judge or running for political office and, you know, having bills that address the change of the system. Um, but there's lots of people working on criminal justice reform. Um, and so there are groups of people you can also join to be a part of that kind of work. Um, so it is easy to get overwhelmed. The world has lots of problems. People make lots of mistakes. I think power does corrupt. There is racism and sexism in the world. Um, and so for Christians, I think the sort of the anchor point is that we need to hang on to that God cares and God wants it to be better and God can empower us to do our part in taking steps as we go forward to make those improvements. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I would add one, one thing here. Um, there's a man on death row in Oklahoma named Richard Glossop. Um, our maximum security prison uh, and death row are in McAllister, Oklahoma. Our church, Boston Avenue Church, is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But we broadcast our services on television, which reach the community of McAllister. A few years ago, uh, Mr. Glossop wrote me, said that he worships with us on Sunday morning that he has grown in his faith as a result of being connected to us. And he was wondering if I could come to McAllister uh, as his pastor or a pastor uh, to be in a relationship with him to help him grow in his faith. So I think that is a good example of how redemption is possible. Now, Mr. Glossop maintains his innocence. There are certainly factual problems with the case that was um, presented against him, uh, which convicted him. Um, he maintains his innocence, and he has from the beginning of uh, this odyssey that he's a part of, where a man was murdered uh, on the premises where he worked. Um, and so it's a complicated matter. Um, I have gone to visit him, uh, but it just, it's, I think, just recognizing the connection between our church and some of these issues and people who get caught up in the web of the criminal justice system uh, that, as I said earlier, we know uh, in, in a whole array of cases where people were completely innocent uh, that got caught up in the investigation, were identified, were finally arrested and tried and found guilty. And then later they identified that DNA evidence or other evidence made it completely impossible for that person to be the perpetrator. Um, so I think as a Christian, 
we always do well to take a humble approach to things. And in humility, I think it's much better that we refrain from engaging in capital punishment. Um, I think we make way too many mistakes. And um, there's a Methodist pastor who's related to the victim in the case that Richard Glossop was convicted of, um, who has a very different view than I do in terms of what should happen. And it's not that I don't want his family uh, to be able to have some closure uh, on the death that happened, uh, but to kill a man that may be innocent uh, to me is, is not good closure and really begs and creates more questions than it answers. So um, our congregation will be struggling with this, I think, as we go forward. Um, Mr. Glossop is on death row. He's on the same list that Julius Jones is on. His name's just a little further down the list. He's come within hours of being executed uh, on a, two or three occasions before this. Um, as Oklahoma begins capital punishment again, um, all Oklahomans are going to have to grapple if they're going to be um, responsible as citizens, I think, of the state uh, as to if that's our best course moving forward. I would hope we would choose a different course moving forward. Thank you so much, David. This has been the Ascends at Boston Avenue podcast. Our producer is Alicia Urban. Our theme music was composed and performed by Wyatt Smith. Boston Avenue United Methodist Church is a progressive historic church located in downtown Tulsa, Oklahoma. Please visit our social media platforms for more information on what's going on at Boston Avenue UMC. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Going on at Boston Avenue UMC. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you.